morning. Time again now to first. I want to welcome each and every one here this morning. Looks like the ground is pretty low this morning. <coughs> Don't have much announcements. Members of Craig Lowe, the Tony Prayer List, and those in the military, those in the nursing home, and here's some updates on some of them. Dawn was sick today, couldn't make it. <coughs> Alfred Egan has found a congregation to attend entirely. And Marty Powers is doing some better. The nurse said his tissue at the site of the surgery had looked excellent. Friday, they re sewed his wound and his healing again. And Marty said thanks to all, <coughs> all for all the prayers. <coughs> Mary's Ben Vector had a success, successful surgery on her leg and now recovered at home. She is still struggling with chemo and fighting cancer at this time. <coughs> Zach Malin, and Gerald Jr. sons, a local young man related to the Dolphins who has been diagnosed with a form of cancer. <coughs> DBS meeting, we'll have, we will have another meeting this Wednesday before midweek Bible study. <coughs> June the 2nd, speech, the speaker will be coming from the children's home that we support in form of the work and preach at AM Worship. <coughs> Song books to page one sixty six. Page one sixty six. He is. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know. Talks with me along my narrow way. 
the hills of life. Page 97. <coughs> if you will, if you'd like to, please stand for this song. And after the song, uh, Tom is going to have open prayer. Encamped along the hills of life, she Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith, Faith is the victory. Just a 
song before communion will be 345. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Of the cup. 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask your blessings upon the loaf which represents the body of Christ Jesus. And as we partake of this, let us remember there was only one gift and one sacrifice, and we're all partakers of that one body. It's in the name of Jesus, we ask your blessing. Amen. the bloodshed of Jesus on the cross for the sins of the world. Our Father, we pray that we will take this in a living life. We pray this in Christ's name. The Apostle Paul instructed the church in the Corinthian letter, he said, lay by and store on the first day of the week. And if we're absent, we can't follow that command. So it's important that that's another reason why that we should assemble every day. Our Father in heaven, forgive us of our sins, and as we back a portion of our trust with 
The song after the message will be 671. Song of invitation after the message, 671.
parable is often told with a huge a lot, of, a lot of emphasis given to the prodigal son. And rightly so, there is quite a bit said, and he, he seems at many points to be the main point of the story. But as with many of Jesus' parables, and as with the uh, pattern and way of teaching, especially in the Middle East, especially in that time, he was not really the driving home point. He was not the true main character of the story. Perhaps it might be the father, but personally I believe that the main character seems to be the other brother, and we'll see that through the course of uh, studying through this parable. If you will follow along with me as we read this morning's text, Luke chapter 11, 15, verses 11 through 32. If you didn't bring your Bible with you this morning, there should be one in the pew around you somewhere, and I'll also have it here on the screen beside me. Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he was received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This morning, I'm wanting us to look at three particular parts, and I want us to make a three points and notice three points about this parable. First, the indecent proposal. The son, in particular, the prodigal, made an indecent proposal to his father and demanded something that was seen as greatly out of place and wrong. And next, I want us to look at how the prodigal was Sleepless in Swineville, how he found himself feeding pigs, how he found himself in a position that uh, no Israelite would ever dare to be in. It seemed so pitiful and horrible that they could never hope again to be a part of society. And last, the tale of two sons. Looking at this wrap-up about what this parable is really about and how both of these sons ended up playing a role in their father's house. First, the indecent proposal. It may not seem like much for us. It may not seem greatly uh, wrong what this son did in demanding his property and saying, give me my uh, allotment, give me my inheritance. Essentially, the prodigal son was saying to his father, I wish you were already dead. Hurry up and die, please. It was not done in Israel. Inheritance was not given until after the father had passed. 
Now, sometimes, under rare circumstances, the land was divided up beforehand between the different children, the different sons, and the allotment would be there, and they would know which property was theirs. Yet, it was not out of the father's possession. He could do whatever he wanted with it until he passed. But in this, not only does the son demand that the allotment be made and that he be shown which part is his, but then on top of that, we're going to see what he does with it. He doesn't leave it in his father's care. He wants it for himself. I don't believe that this sort of thing would uh, stand today. I don't believe that this sort of thing would fly, as we often say. It wouldn't, wouldn't be kosher. People would not accept it. I know that if I had looked to my father when I was uh, 16, 17 years old and said, give me your truck, it's going to be one, one, mine one day anyway when you die, it wouldn't have went over pretty well. It would have been pretty bad, in fact. It just isn't done. It wouldn't have been kosher for me to go up to my parents and say, go ahead and give me my portion of what our house is worth. After all, you're going to give it to me someday, so I want it now. Imagine how much more so in a society that demanded respect. And when I say demanded respect, that's not to say that there are no respectful people today. And that is not to say that no one demands respect today. But I don't think we fully comprehend what kind of respect they demanded and how harshly they demanded it. Look with me over in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, we're going to see what is said about a, a childless son who does not act properly toward their parents, toward their father specifically. Deuteronomy chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. If a man has a rebellious, a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Now notice what happens next. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. I had some pretty bad witnesses growing up. I had some pretty harsh discipline. There would be some things we had to go pick up, stitch the rocks out of the yard, or perhaps some other form of punishment that we had. But I was never, in the presence of the entire town, had everybody gathered together and stoned me to death with stones, as I'm sure you're aware by the fact that I'm standing here today. We might say, well, that, that's a little extreme. Isn't that a little much? This was something important. Did you notice the purpose? It was more just than a punishment for rebellious and stubborn son. It was so that all of Israel would hear about it and fear. It was to make an example. Respect to parents was extremely important. And unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have carried over till today. If something like this was done today, the parents of the entire town would be thrown in jail and possibly given death penalty themselves. It would be horrendous for such punishment to take place. That's how God felt about respect to parents. If you'll notice when you look at the Ten Commandments, the only commandment in the Ten Commandments that's given with a promise as well with it is to honor your father and mother and you will live long in the land. This was something very important. It was very important to the people of Israel. Those who would be hearing Jesus tell this parable and in telling of this son coming to his father and saying, give me my land now. Give me my inheritance now. They would be disgusted. They would be angry. They would be upset at Jesus just for mentioning something that's taking place. This was extreme. We're not talking about a child throwing a fit in Walmart and the parent being embarrassed. We are talking about a child doing something so horrendous, so horrible, that it shocked a nation. And yet, even in the face of this, the father grants him this wish. Now, if anything was going to be more shocking than what the son did, it would perhaps be the response that the father gave him. The people listening would not have easily uh, uh, thought of themselves in this parable as being the son. 
They certainly would not have thought of themselves in this parable as being represented by the Father. They would have seen the Father as being lax, as not giving him proper discipline. Even if he didn't stone him, he should not give him what he asked for. He shouldn't condone his action. They would be disgusted by the Father almost as much as the Son. They would feel that he was being uh, way too lenient and making it, and not, instead of making an example of him and keeping this from continuing. Now, I mentioned a bit ago, what's more than him demanding his portion and knowing how much he deserved, which the older son got a double portion. So the remaining son, the younger son, would have gotten one third of the estate. Apart from doing that, he then liquidated the assets. I mentioned that sometimes, under rare occasions, the father would have portioned out and let each know what your parts would be. And perhaps they would use that in their dealings and trades and planning for future years. But it was still under the father's control. Here the son sold his assets. Something that still belonged to his father. And his father allowed it. His father didn't stop it. The actual wording there, uh, when he gathered up his belongings, that literally means that's that word sonago, which means turn into cash. To liquidate there. So apart from this indecent proposal that was made, apart from this horrendous action that was taken, what follows would even make this more outrageous, more of a scandal. Not only has the son acted so foolishly, he didn't do this in order to go buy a farm in a foreign land, to take a respectable wife somewhere and just start his own family. He did this, and then he went and spent the money on wasteful living. Now, we might call this that he was living the high life. That he was just doing whatever felt good. Literally, when it says he squandered it on, uh, on uh, living that was not considered good, what it means is he literally took his possessions and threw them in the wind. That's the imagery that's given by that word. What is this uh, wild living? It's describing something that was not only reckless, not only not smart to do with, with the possession of the money that he had, but it was immoral. This son disgraced his father, disgraced all of Israel, disgraced his entire family, and then on top of that went and did something even more disgraceful. He went and lived a prodigal life. He went and lived immorally, wasted his possessions. It's interesting that Saul, uh, the preacher in Ecclesiastes, mentions this kind of an idea. He amassed this great wealth and he would leave it to someone, and who knows whether he's going to be wise or not. After Solomon dies, everything that he has is going to go to his son, his children. And he had no uh, promise, no guarantee that it's going to be worth leaving it to them. Who knows what they're going to do with the money? They might waste it like this prodigal did on riotous living. After all this takes place, after he blows all his money, throws it all into the wind, he finds himself in the lowest of the low. He is doing something that no Jew would do, that many would starve before considering. Not only is he working for a Gentile, someone who is not a Jew, which was just out of bounds, he didn't do it, it was disgraceful enough to be cut off from Israel. But he's working for a Gentile feeding pigs, an unclean animal. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7 outlines the specific of the fact it was unclean there. It just was not done. This would have been incredible. How could he do this? The people listening to this parable would have thought, how extreme is Jesus going to go with this? He's gone so far, no one in their right mind would ever really do this. It would be impossible for this prodigal son to actually exist. Somebody, somebody in the family would have went and taken care of him. Somebody would have done something. So poor had he become that he longed for the pods they were feeding the pigs. The carbon pods, literally, is what this many believe this to be. Now these carbon pods, there's actually a rabbinic saying that goes along with this. That this was something that the, the poor would eat, the poorest of the poor. This was your bottom of the line food. 
And this old rabbinic saying went that when the Israelites were reduced to the carbon pots to eating, that then would they repent. And only then. Then it would take them sinking to the lowest of the low, eating these carbon pots, for them to finally repent. Well, it's at this point that that's exactly what happens. The son, the prodigal son, sitting in his table, doing something despicable, not having any food, wanting even the food that he's slopping the hogs with, and can't even get that. And he comes to himself. He realizes the servants in my father's house are better taken care of than this. They at least have something to eat. They're treated well. I don't even have to go back to my father as a son. There's no way he would take me back as a son. But even as a servant, I would be in a much better position. So he decides. He's going to go to his father's house. He's going to come back to him and plead. There's a, another proverb that kind of goes along the lines of this, a rabbinic proverb, that when a son abroad goes barefoot, then he remembers the comfort of his father's house. That barefoot represents being uh, very poor, going without needs. Interestingly, it's something that's going to show up when he returns to his father. Is that, uh, the way you could tell the difference between a servant and a son walking around someone's house was about whether or not they had shoes, they had sandals. Sandals was a mark of difference between the servant and the son. Well, he decides, I'm going to go back to my father's house. I'm going to go and beg him to let me be his servant. I'm going to tell him, not only have I sinned against you, but I've sinned against heaven. That was a proper way for them to refer to God. Lest they take the name of God in vain, they just refer to him as heaven. That was their way of referring to that. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you, Father. Now, we don't have any idea what motivated uh, I say this, uh, we don't know what specifically motivated the prodigal son. Perhaps he, he was not truly sorry. It would seem, based on what he does and his reaction he has, but many say, well, he wasn't really sorry. He was just wanting to be in a better situation to be a servant. Yet, the, the case of this parable would indicate by the fact that Jesus is telling it and using it for the illustration he gives, this is a man that's hit the bottom. The only way he knows is to look up to see his father. So he goes back to his father. And while he's still a far off coming, the father gets up in his robes and runs to him. Here's another shot. I can just picture the crowd of these Jews that are listening thinking, look how shocking this story is. It was socially unacceptable for a father to run in his robes. It just wasn't done. It showed a lack of class. It was disrespectful. On rare occasions, perhaps, if a son had died and he just learned, he could run to go check on him and see. But this was just not done. The father runs to him. The son that is shamed of his whole family, that is disgraced him, and meets him before he even comes. And the son tells him, I've sinned against the heaven, I've sinned against you. Let me just be a servant. And what does the father do? Does he then drag him before the city and have everybody crab out the stones and throw at him? Does he give him a 10-minute lecture? Do you know what you've done? Do you know how you squandered property? Disrespected our faith? No, he doesn't do that either. He says, grab the fatted calf, the one we've been saving for a celebration. Notice, he didn't go get a lamb. This isn't enough for a small family celebration. This fatted calf would be enough to feed the town. He's having a town hall. Go get the fat calf. Go get some sandals and put them on his feet. He's not a servant, he's a son. Go get a signet ring and put it on his finger. He's back in my family. My son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. It's interesting that uh, oftentimes in rabbinic uh, stories like this, brackets are kind of put in by a saying repeated to really stress this is an important part. And that saying, uh, he was lost, and he was dead, and now he's alive, he lost, and now he's found, is going to be repeated again at the end of this parable. Kind of brackets this off and really sticks out to people that this is where the real part of the story is coming in. This is where the parable is getting serious. We're getting down to the main point. After all this has taken place, they're feasting in the house. The whole town is there. It's loud. And the older son comes in from the field. He sees this great celebration and asks one of the other servants, what's going on? He tells him, brothers, come back. 
having a celebration in his honor. Now, the son acts very disrespectful. First, it's important to notice that the older son was the one that would usually try to reconcile the father and the younger son. It was his duty. He was the one that was supposed to try to bring him back. He didn't do that. Then, he doesn't even go into the party. He waits outside and has someone go to get his father. He didn't wait till the guests were gone, as would have been the custom. In the middle of all the guests there, he confronts his father. When he addresses him, he doesn't say, Sir, which was something that would have been very out of place. He tells his father off. He said, You never gave me a, a lamb to feast with my friends. And now, the son of yours, this son who's wasted your possessions on prostitutes, who has defiled himself and our whole family, you sacrificed the bad calf for him. Now, the Pharisees, the Jews listening, now they're probably not there. It's all right. You tell this father. They're right alongside of this son. You tell him. He should be given that other prodigal what for? He should be taking him around the bush. He should be giving it to him. I can see him nodding their head, smile on their face. Yeah, that's what needs to happen. This is the son they identify with. That's right where they would be. This is the son that when they saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, they expect me to say, what is he doing eating with tax collectors and sinners? Does he know that he's eating with these prostitutes? Does, does Jesus know what he's doing? It resembles him perfectly. The father reiterates that same phrase. Your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. Shouldn't we rejoice? Who was that son to condemn the Father's mercy and grace? Who was that son to think he's so much better? Everything that the Father had now was his. Yes, he, he'd never went and prodigal like his brother had. Yes, he'd been there serving and being a good son, you might say. But his response was wrong. He should have been happy, feasting with them, excited that his brothers had come. Now, another interesting thing about this parable is the fact that there's not a recorded response from the older brother. After the older brother had been laid in line by his father and shown what he should do, we would expect the son to then respond with, well, I'm sticking with what I said. I'm continuing what I thought. But you were wrong in this, father. You shouldn't have been doing this. Or the other response would be, you know, you're right. I should be happy that my brother's back. I should be rejoicing that my brother was dead and now he's alive, lost and now he's found. But it doesn't record the older brother's response. It's not given on purpose. This allowed the Jews that were standing there to fill in the gap. Were they going to choose to stick with their guns and say, Jesus, you shouldn't eat the sinners and tax collectors. Jesus, you shouldn't go to the sick spiritually. Were they going to stick by that? Or were they going to see the purpose of this parable? That no matter how dirty the sinner, no matter how horrible a person they've been, that God is excited, rejoices when they come back. That God is ecstatic with happiness. The angels are rejoicing in heaven any time a sinner comes back, a sheep comes back to the fold, the lost coin is found, the lost son returns. That brings us around to us. How will you respond to our Father? Our Father in heaven is excited and is happy. Every time a soul is brought home. Every time someone decides to take part in the grace that's offered, the mercy that's given. How are we going to feel about that? Or are we going to, like the older brother, say, Father, how could you forgive them? Do you know what they did? Are you aware of how bad they've been? How dare you forgive them? Or we rejoice. Rejoice with the angels in heaven. Rejoice with the Father. 
be at this large party as it was figuratively shown in the parable because one of our brothers, one of our sisters, who was dead is now alive, who was lost is now found. Perhaps this morning you're lost. Perhaps you're dead in your sin. Perhaps you've been like the prodigal. God will rejoice if you come home. We will rejoice if you come home. No matter how bad you've been, the blood of Jesus washes it all clean. Be buried in a watery grave. Put that old person to death. Not to be that person anymore. To live a new life. One with grace and mercy applied to you. Perhaps you've done that. Perhaps you've been a son, like the son of the sword, but you've walked away. You decided, I'm going to take up everything I got, and I'm just going to go do something that sounds fun. You can come back. Let your footsteps find their way home this morning. Won't you come right now while together we stand and sing? <clears throat> All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is set, ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Thank you again for another beautiful Lord's Day and the opportunity to come together and hear another portion of your word. Thank you for the church here in Campbell, the church worldwide, the missionaries that spread your word, and, and the men and women in the military that protect our many freedoms that we do enjoy through you. Father, thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, and the hope we have through you to be with you in heaven forever. Now it's come time to, in this service that we depart. May we have your blessing that as we return home and, and have, continue to have your blessing at home until it's time to again return to hear another portion of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.